Okay, let's get started. Uh, I'm assuming that the folks in Michigan are recording this, but I'm not sure. <clears throat> so uh, hopefully there'll be a recording available for you in case you wanna refer back. So first of all, I'm Alan Brockstein, and uh, I wanna thank you for joining today. Uh, it's been quite some time since I've done a webinar like this, and I think it's a great time to do so. This has been a very challenging year for the cannabis space, and uh, I think for new investors, it's, it's a great time to be taking a look. And for those of you that are more veteran, uh, it's, uh, this year was a great learning lesson on why it's uh, so important to pay attention uh, to the fundamentals. The, the group has always traded uh, kind of in unison, and this year we've seen some big differentiation, and I'll talk more about that later. So <clears throat> just a little bit about myself. I, I started 420 Investor in uh, 2013, so it's been more than six years, and uh, it's a community uh, of over a thousand, and uh, before I was doing that, I was an investment professional. You can read my background, but uh, really for the last six plus years, I've been known uh, almost seven years actually for focusing on uh, the cannabis sector full time since 2014. And in addition to running 420 Investor, I also run New Cannabis Ventures and uh, that is a public facing, uh, there's no gate or anything, it's open to everybody. Uh, and it's, it's really the most trafficked and I would say best uh, website uh, focused on the, the cannabis uh, industry's financial aspects. And I'm happy to answer any questions about that later. And speaking of questions, before we go on, I have a brief presentation. Uh, it shouldn't take more than 20 minutes or so. And uh, once we're through that, I will open it up to Q&A. And uh, so with that, uh, so what we're gonna talk about today is really how the cannabis uh, investing has changed over the past seven years since I've been following it. Really pretty much since the beginning. I mean, you can go back to 2010 and find, or 2009 actually, and find a couple of examples, but uh, really, uh, it really got going in 13. Uh, I also wanna talk in particular about why 2019 was such a rough year, our second down year in a row. And then I'm gonna talk about some positive and negatives as we enter 2020. Uh, so let's take a, a quick uh, review of the history. And so uh, what we're looking at on the right is the uh, New Cannabis Ventures Global Cannabis Stock Index. And uh, I, I just wanna walk you through some major events over the last few years. And, and this cuts off at the beginning of this year, the end of last year. So we'll, we'll take a look at what this year looks like in just a, a moment. But what you'll see, uh, not to ruin it, you'll see that we've dropped pretty much to those lows of 2016. So uh, just going back chronologically, the cannabis industry, uh, kind of came to life as a result of the Colorado and Washington votes in late 2012. And in 2013, early 13, there was a little bit of a rally. And you can see that right here. That was uh, uh, kind of a delayed reaction to that. But uh, as I'm gonna mention later, you have to be really careful looking at the history. There were not a lot of companies uh, back then. And so uh, going into 2014, there was a lot of concern because the federal government had not really said, okay, go ahead, Colorado and Washington. So it wasn't really clear. So two things happened in the summer and really helped uh, solidify my decision to enter the space full time. One was uh, the coal memo, which was the federal government's uh, eight point rules uh, for uh, you know what, what it would be take for a state to be involved in state legal cannabis without risking uh, enforcement from the federal government. That was huge. And then on top of that, uh, Sanjay Gupta did the first weed episode uh, in, in uh, that summer of 2013 as well. And that really set the stage for people starting to think about cannabis is more than just a recreational drug, is something with truly uh, pow powerful medical benefits. And so you see that explosion in 2014, and that was basically, you know, 20 stocks and a lot of people uh, plowing into the industry when Colorado went legal. It was like a wake up call, like, oh my God, I can invest in, in cannabis. And these people that did this really had no idea what they were buying. It was a bunch of crap, as I'll talk about later. And so the next couple of years, the market sold all the way off and then some. And then in 2016, at the end of the year, and it's kind of hard to see because uh, you know this kind of pales it, but it was actually a really nice rally. Uh, and this is one that I had called basically to the day. It started Labor Day and it was ahead of, uh, I think seven states that had either medical or legal cannabis on the ballots that year, the biggest of which was California. And uh, 
not every state won. Arizona uh, did not pass uh, adult use, but every other state won. And it was really uh, an exciting time. Of course, Donald Trump got elected and that threw a curveball because people weren't expecting that. They weren't sure of his policies and the Republicans gained control of the Senate, if I'm not mistaken. And it really kind of left a, a, an awkward situation of uncertainty regarding the federal uh, political landscape. And so in 2017, we just kind of went sideways after that big rally at the end of the year. But then people started to get excited about California and we shot up in late into the year, uh, what I called the Cali rally, another call I had, had right, I don't get them all right, but those were two kind of easy to predict uh, uh, trades. And then uh, uh, Jeff Sessions rescinded the coal memo, which I mentioned earlier, and, and the market started to pull back sharply. And we've been in decline since then. And it's not just because the coal memo was rescinded. There's been a lot of issues, which I'll address in a moment. Well, one of the other factors you need to be aware of is that in 2018, Canada went fully legal. And there was a lot of hype uh, about that. And that was that run up here. And the hype never met, uh, the reality never met the hype. So let's take a look now. Uh, at uh, the market in uh, 2019. I just wanna make sure I, I didn't lose my place there. All right, uh, so the market's really changed. That's the first point I wanna make. I just walked you through the history, but I wanna to talk to you about the dynamics of the market. And in 2012, there weren't a lot of companies. They weren't real. They weren't really tied to the cannabis industry really in any way, except for pretending to be cannabis players for the most part. They all traded on the OTC. This was pre-Canada being the capital capital capital, uh, and there were no institutional investors and there was literally no research. It was a wild west and I was kind of earning my reputation uh, in those first three years, I would say, uh, 13, 14, 15, uh, even into 16, as being the sheriff of that wild west, trying to warn people about all the scams that were out there. Now let's fast forward to today, where there's lots of companies, like more than 500, and many of them are real, and I'll show you that. Uh, the TSX and the CSC, as well as the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange host some of these companies, and there's now even mutual funds and ETFs. We've seen institutional investors enter the space, and there's a whole bunch of analysts, thank God, covering the space now. I don't have to do all the work. So that's really the big difference. And, uh, you can invest now in a whole bunch of different types of uh, companies and there's a whole nother way to look at this. You could go US or go uh, Canada or beyond, but just focusing on the parts of the market, uh, there's uh, cultivation, processing and retail. Sometimes those are all bundled together. And then there's also companies like GW Pharma that are on the FDA path. There aren't that many of those, but there's some. And then on the other side, we're, uh, and on the left-hand side is where most of the investments are today. On the right-hand side uh, is what I call ancillary, and there's a whole bunch of different segments that cater to the cannabis uh, industry without directly touching them, uh, touching the plant. So this is an area that I think will develop more over time. There are some examples today. So I said earlier, it's a real industry, and you can see that, uh, it is indeed. These are. This is something from New Cannabis Ventures. It's you can find it right at the top of the page. It's something that, that we update daily. Uh, actually, we just updated it yesterday, but uh, it's. I, I did these slides this weekend. But um, the what this shows is not only the sales, and these are for U.S. dollar reporting, and these are for, for Canadian and the sales in the last quarter and the growth rates, but also what I call adjusted operating income, which is essentially operating income. Uh, with one change, and that is that we don't uh, include what's called biological assets. This is a really trivial little point, and it's going to go away anyway because a lot of these companies are moving to U.S. GAAP away from IFRS. That's something you don't really need to concern yourself with, but for now, we're using this. And So you, you can see, just looking at the U.S., that there's three multi-state operators that all had revenue in excess of $60 million. Multiply that by four to get an annualized rate. So uh, over... Uh, over uh, 240 million a year, a quarter of a billion each, just those three. Uh, and you can see a range of, of profitability with this one, True Leaf being profitable, Green Thumb being about break even, and Cure Leaf being slightly unprofitable. But uh, so this is very different from 2013 when there were no revenues and just jokes of companies. And you can go over to the Canadian side and see the same thing as well. Several companies, uh, this, these are Canadian dollars, but if you do the math in, in excess of 30 million, there's 
slash three, and uh, again, a range of profitability. So this is one of the main points I want everybody to understand that's new today to the whole idea of investing in cannabis. There are a bunch of real companies. Doesn't make them good investments necessarily, but they are real companies. Uh, I already did that one. Let's see if I can figure out how to work this. All right, so let's talk about 2019. It has been horrible, and it followed a bad year in 2018, which was really washout from the Canadian uh, legalization. And so some of the major factors that were driving the weakness this year, and we got off to a great start. Last, last year, a year ago, the market was in meltdown mode, with the, along with the rest of the uh, equity markets in general and we were seeing uh, a lot of supply hit the market uh and, and and these deals busted and so it was a great time to be buying near the end of the year uh, as you can see uh there was a, a dip all the way down in december and right around christmas eve it bottomed out and in the first quarter uh looking at the end of the first quarter i think cannabis stocks were up about 54 percent as measured by this index so what happened so first of all uh, you know, we, we were trading off and it seemed like a, a pretty normal type of consolidation. And then in July, uh, the proverbial poop hit the fan. What happened? Canada, uh, we saw CanTrust. Uh, this was a highly trusted name. Hell, they had trust in their name. Uh, and it turned out to be a huge, huge scandal where they were breaking the law left and right. Uh, and also there was a weak rollout in Canada that was becoming uh, more and more understood in the summer. It's been even worse than we would have expected, and that's played out through the balance of the year. Why is it weak? There aren't that many retail stores. That's the main reason. And secondarily, uh, the types of products that were allowed for sale were essentially pre-rolls and flour for the most part. And you know, if you go to the United States, about half the market is beyond that and includes edibles and extracts. All right, so then the second factor, all year long, California, the black market won. And that's starting to change a little bit. We'll talk more about that later, but it was a very weak rollout in California. These were two things that brought in a lot of investors uh, over the last couple of years that just didn't meet expectations. Then in September, we got hit with the vaping crisis. And the vaping crisis, if, if you weren't following it, was not really about the legal cannabis market. It was about the uh, the illicit market, but it had some impact and included one state, Massachusetts, uh, implementing a four-month ban on vaping that hit, hurt the cannabis industry, which isn't that big yet in Massachusetts. So in aggregate, it wasn't big. A lot of people were afraid it was going to escalate, uh, and it really never did. And then the fourth thing, kind of a consequence of all this, uh, there's been uh, a, a very strong capital markets up in Canada for the last few years, and it hit a brick wall. And we started to see right after the vaping crisis, some companies grabbed for money through really cheap equity offerings. And this is really weighed. And all of a sudden, there's a, a loss of confidence in the ability to raise capital. And people have started to look at these companies, uh, questioning whether they're going to be going concerns, uh, assuming that they won't be able to access capital. So we'll talk more about that later. So, so let's shift into the final uh, part of this, which is looking at some of the, uh, the, the positives and negatives for 2020. And then I'm going to answer questions shortly. So first of all, in Canada, I mentioned earlier two big problems. No, no derivative products like edibles and extracts, really, and not enough stores. Uh, suffice it to say that both of these things are being addressed. It's not a panacea. It's not something that all of a sudden is going to make it great, but we're moving in the right direction. Now, in the United States, uh, some catalysts ahead uh, for this year. First of all, uh, I think Illinois is going to be uh, known to be the best legalization ever. And uh, it's a, an existing medical market that's mature. There's a protected um, uh, supplier base that, that can hit the ground running, although there will be shortages at first. There are more stores in Illinois, which is smaller than Ontario on day one than Ontario has a year later. So all in all, uh, this is going to, I believe, uh, do a couple of things. Uh, it's going to excite people sentiment wise because it's going to uh, maybe catalyze some of the states around Illinois to consider legalizing and get some speculation going there, number one. And number two, this was the first time a, a state legislature has just legalized. Usually it's through the ballot box and you have these voter referendums. And this may lead to some more states 
going that legislative route. It's, it's a better, more certain way to do things. So the second catalyst this year is going to be the elections. Uh, in November, I think we're going to see uh, maybe F Florida on the ballot if it doesn't go through the legislature, which I'll cover in just a moment. Uh, we're going to see uh, uh, Arizona potentially as well. So you could, Florida is a, a huge one, obviously. Uh, and then uh, I, I, I didn't uh, so I, I have down on the bottom the, my third point, which is that you could see these four states, Florida, New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania, all go via the legislature. But actually, uh, we just learned uh, yesterday that, or the day before that New Jersey, if they don't go through the legislature, it will be on the ballot. So we're going to have some catalysts late in the year, in my opinion. But there's reasons for concern. And, you know, anybody that knows me knows I'm always, you know, a, lo a lot of people like me just want to tell you the positives. They want you to buy your subscription and just uh, be blind sheep and yay, it's all going to work out. That's just not the way it has been and not the way it will be, by the way. And uh, so I always like to point to, uh, you know, look for holes in the arguments and point to some issues. And I, I did this slide this weekend and we just learned one of my points, uh, the point two, but first of all, I mentioned the capital crunch. It's not going away anytime fast. So this is going to separate the proverbial men from the boys. And when it's all said and done, the companies that can tr uh, earn the trust of investors will be capitalized and they will take market share and some others will perish. And so that's going to be an interesting dynamic all year, but they could really weigh on the whole market while some people benefit. Second point, and like I said, I did this this weekend, we just learned that that first point, Safe Banking Act, looks dead on arrival. I've been saying that for a while, by the way, but we just learned yesterday that uh, Mike Crapo, who has its uh, control, obviously Mitch McConnell ultimately, uh, doesn't like what was passed in Congress. This is something that is not that big of a deal anyway, uh, except for sentiment, I would say, but it essentially, it's, it's very smart legislation that would be a public safety benefit, and it would allow uh, uh, dispensaries to not have to take cash. It would be huge from just saving people's lives, and a little bit good for the industry, but, but mainly it's more for sentiment. The States Act is more about, or they might even call it the Moore Act now, but these things are more about legalizing cannabis. It's not happening. I'm not gonna get into that now, you don't invest in the space expecting cannabis to be legalized in the short term. It's not happening, and it's actually not that good. I can explain that more later. Now, Canada is going to have some pricing pressure, and this is already playing out, and it's going to dent the thesis there a little bit. And we're going to see a lot of Canadian LPs go under. Uh, so, again, the survivors should benefit. And then finally, hemp was, pro was such a promising development. It was legalized a year ago. And here we are like 15 months later in CBD. I say hemp is a mess. It's really CBD from hemp that's a mess. It's a mess because there's all sorts of state regulations. The FDA is trying to weigh in. Uh, people are being arrested uh, for selling CBD, believe it or not. Huge demand, but lots of problems. And so uh, uh, if you look at the hemp stocks, the hemp CBD stocks, they have uh, been pummeled. So uh, just to wrap up this first part, um, sticking to my 20 minutes or so, uh, cannabis stocks uh, are about to end two straight down years, pretty rough, you know, down like 40% or so this year after being down 50% or so last year. Uh, I explained that the weakness is, is due to factors, multiple factors that are uh, uh, appropriate for both Canada and the United States. I've talked about some positives in 2020, but there's going to be challenges. And so I, I think uh, my bottom line is that uh, there's opportunities for, for some companies and risk for many companies, and you as investors uh, should expect volatility. So with that, let me just briefly uh, talk about 420 Investor, which I said I started in uh, 2013. We just had our sixth anniversary. There are a lot of features uh, at 420 Investor. Uh, that people count on. And uh, one of them is the news and alerts. You get the news really fast, the important news at uh, 420 Investor. So uh, not only do you get my news, if, if it's something that I need to weigh in on, you get my opinion as well. Uh, one of the most popular features are the three model portfolios that have real-time trade alerts. Uh, they're all designed uh, to have slightly different goals. Uh, one of them is a swing trading model portfolio. The other two are longer term focused and fully invested all the time. Another feature is the forum, and this is really the hidden gem of, of uh, 
420 Investor. So much information there. Definitely worth checking out. Uh, it's a great way to learn about a company or ask me questions as well. Uh, I send out weekly summaries on Friday, and I also publish a monthly newsletter. These are, you know, take a longer term view. And for those that don't like the constant bombardment, I get a complaint, too much information. And so for those that you, that want to tune out that too much information, these summaries are helpful. I do 10 videos per week. Uh, I, I do them in, uh, an hour after the open each morning during the week. And then I do what's called the pre-market video uh, Monday nights through Thursday nights. And then I do a very long and comprehensive video on the weekend that it's worth the price of membership alone. And it usually runs about an hour and a half and I'm talking about usually about 35 uh, names. And then also we host a chat on, weekly, uh, on a weekly basis on, on Tuesday nights. So the benefits of uh, being a member of 420 Investors, you get quick and reliable information on important stocks. There's, you get uh, some depth of coverage in my perspective uh, we, I have found over the last six years that uh, everybody from novices to pros, we have them all and they all uh, find value. Uh, I share lots of ideas. So if you just want to copy the model portfolios, you can do that. I really prefer that people develop their own uh, portfolios and uh, listen, you know, look at what I'm doing in the model portfolios to, to inform and educate about that. But I share a lot of other ideas as well. And then one other benefit is that we have a very interactive community. And uh, uh, this is actually one of the best things about 420 Investor because it allows uh, people that are in the same boat to uh, collaborate together. All right, so with that, you are in for a treat. Uh, I'm gonna move into Q&A now, but I just wanna say, in. Uh, Two years ago, we raised the price from 420 to, to 599. It's been that. There's never been a single discounted sale since then. Uh, the markets are down right now. And I think this is a great time to uh, join. And I'm willing to cut the price today only. And the reason for that is what I have found over six years is that most people only want to invest in 420 investor subscription when the markets are rocking and rolling. And I would rather incentivize people to come in right now when that's far from the way I would describe it. We are in the midst of a, of a very uh, weak market. And uh, while I'm optimistic uh, that next year will be better, I can't promise that tomorrow will be better. I'm uh, looking for that bottom myself. Uh, as a reminder, uh, if you use code 2020, uh, you will be charged $420 instead of $599, saving 30%. But you can always cancel within the first 30 days if you find out it's not for you. And if you're gonna do this, make sure you do it before midnight tonight. It's a one-time opportunity. So with that, uh, I think uh, there's nine questions that have been asked and I will answer these all uh, verbally right now. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure that you guys can see the questions, um, uh, but I can and I will read them and answer them. Uh, so the first one is, uh, why is Cureleaf below the IPO price when it might exceed 1.2 billion in sales in 2020? Well, so I would say there's a lot of reasons. First of all, the whole market is down and a lot of their peers are at or below their uh, IPO prices. And so that was a time when there was a lot of hype and, uh, and you know, it was followed by a huge meltdown. And uh, a lot of those companies went on to double or triple off those lows, but they've pulled back. So, you know, part of the answer might just be in general, this is the, the nature of the beast. I would say also, you got to be careful when you say it might exceed 1.2 billion in sales. There are pending acquisitions that haven't closed. They said that they would do 400 million this year and they didn't. So, uh, so there's, you know, potentially people don't believe that. And uh, also there'll be a lot of shares issued uh, in conjunction with those deals. So hopefully I've answered that one. Uh, are mushrooms the next big play? I, I don't cover mushrooms, so I'm not gonna answer that one. Uh, who do I predict to benefit from Illinois legalization? So uh, there are two companies that have a very advantaged position in Illinois, and that would be Cresco and GTI. Uh, question earlier was about Cureleaf and uh, Cureleaf uh, uh, has a pending acquisition of grassroots cannabis, which, you know, would benefit it. Uh, also Harvest has a pending acquisition of uh, Verano, which, which would benefit. So these are four. There's others as well. Uh, MedMen has some exposure. Uh, 
Another one that has some exposures forefront, and there may be a few others as well. Uh, this is one point, and thanks for reminding me. Uh, in the past, uh, I would say that there has never been a state where there were established uh, cannabis operators already in operation that legalized. So this is a real nice uh, benefit, in my opinion, for the whole sector and for the investors that there's actually a real catalyst here. I mentioned earlier, Colorado went public. Well, even to this day, there, there are no companies that are publicly traded that are in Colorado. There's about to be, they had to change the law and it's gonna go into effect in Q1 really. But uh, when the licenses get transferred, the law has changed, the licenses will be transferred. But so this is a real unique time where uh, Illinois legalizing, and Illinois is a big state by the way, uh, uh, the second biggest state except for California to legalize. Uh, all right, next question is, what can I tell us about the Green Flower Media Education courses? Look, I'm here to talk about cannabis stocks, so I don't, I'm not here to talk about Green Flower Media, sorry. Uh, next is, uh, is the Indos vape system the best? I am not familiar with that. Uh, I cover publicly traded cannabis stocks, and uh, uh, I'm not sure that that's associated with any publicly traded cannabis stock. What is my take on True Leaf report from Grizzly? So the Grizzly report, if you didn't see it, so these guys in general, the sh short reports in general, take facts and they try to make them all sound bad and they stack them up. So they, you know, they are short. That's how they're going to make money by scaring people. So with that said, there were some things in there that I really uh, was already aware of and, and appreciate uh, the FBI situation as well as some related party transactions. But there was a lot of stuff in there that was really uh, uh, just sensational and not relevant. Or, or I don't want to say they lied because I, I don't think there were any lies, but it was written by somebody that appeared to not really know what they were talking about from my perspective. What's my thought on magical system to make edibles? Again, uh, this is a, a discussion about publicly traded cannabis stocks, so uh, I'm not going to be able to answer that one. Uh, next question is... Uh, where do I see South Africa and Sub-Sahara Africa as players within the global grow arena? So look, this is a topic I follow, but not very closely. There aren't a lot of public company plays into this. And what I found over the years, you know, investors that run off to Colombia or Africa or all parts of the world, even Australia, developed country, are basically asking people to take their money and uh, just be slow to look at this stuff. Uh, I think it's very possible that we'll see a more active global market, but there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed in terms of, you know, which countries are going to actually allow imports and how that process works. So my recommendation is if you think this is a smart thing, look for the public companies. And I, if you join, I'll tell you who they are that are involved in this and, and poised to benefit. But I don't see this as a massive catalyst right now. The next question is, what are my thoughts on synthetic can cannabis for medical companies like Willow and Demetrix? So the question's a little bit inaccurate. I think the right way to ask this question is biosynthetic. So just so everybody understands the CBD molecule, the THC molecule, all the other cannabinoids, <clears throat> there are companies that are working on creating these in various forms. So one would be synthetic and we've seen synthetic drugs approved and there's been some issues with them and I am not a fan. I will say that. But two, biosynthesis is a relatively new topic. I've been covering this very closely for three or four years now. I think it's uh, extremely important to stay on top of it. It could result if these guys are successful in, uh, and there's a lot of players and it's not clear yet that they'll succeed. And the players that were mentioned in the question, Willow Bioscience and Demetrix are just two of them. And there's some others that are ahead of them in my opinion. But uh, this, what, what happens here is they use forms like yeast to generate real cannabinoids. It's just not through the cannabis plant, it's through biotech processes, but using yeast, uh, algae, things like this. So, uh, so I think this is an extremely important topic. Uh, you, I don't think you can invest in the space without paying attention to it. Uh, I'm watching for more developments so far. There's been no commercialization, but there are some big players with big funding involved. Do I cover ETFs as well? So I uh, pay attention to the ETFs. I don't make any sort of recommendations on them. In general, the ETFs are not that great. They're very Canada focused and for 
really for legal reasons, you can't really get the right kind of ETF. And there's a whole bunch of losers out there. There's really just two ETFs that are that are large and liquid. And I'm not a huge fan, although I like them better than I did when they came out. Please explain setting up portfolios. Can you re-ask that question? Because I'm not sure I understand that one. All right, the next question is, and that was, that was Andre Tate. If you could just re-ask that question in a way I can uh, answer that better. Uh, what do I mean when I said not federally legal is actually better than B? Uh, so it's a not very well-kept secret that the best chance for success for startup cannabis companies is for it to remain federally illegal. This murky situation keeps out large, well-funded players who have too much to lose. So if you're, if you're betting on federal legalization, the company you're investing in may just get wiped out overnight. I, I think that's a very important point. So uh, status quo is excellent, in my opinion. The things you want to watch out for are any sort of backtracking from the federal government, where they, if, if you just go back to two years ago when Jeff Sessions rescinded the Cole memo, this scared everybody badly. And, uh, you know, people don't want to lose their money, their property, their businesses, and these are the real risks. So it, it's, a, it's, it's not necessarily something that makes sense at first blush to everybody, but, it's, but the status quo, in other words, being federally illegal, but where the federal government is not going back to the Stone Ages is the best situation. Is Tilray and Kronos a good company that can last? Uh, are Tilray and Kronos good company? So uh, I think that both of these companies are taking a different tack than some of their competitors, uh, trying to be asset light. And uh, this may work to their advantage uh, if they can get their supply chain knocked down. All these large LPs are singing the same song. Canada stinks and we're looking at hemp in the US. And I told you earlier, hemp is a mess. And so that leaves me a little bit concerned that these companies aren't gonna be able to operate uh, on their game plan uh, in the near term. Uh, so it's a little too early for me to say that those companies are, are great companies, but uh, you know, Tilray has a, a, a money problem. They don't have enough of it. And Kronos has a partner that gave them plenty of money. So I guess that's a good thing. It gives them some downside protection, but we'll see if these companies can actually uh, become profitable and uh, scale up. Uh, YGYI has guidance for 40, 60 million in CBD next year. What do I think? I don't cover that one that closely. And I just told you, CBD is a mess. So I, I, I would be very careful just going by that company's guidance. It's a multi-level marketing company. I got a really dark spot in my heart for companies that are multi-level marketing companies. I, it's not something I really appreciate, uh, but I don't know that company that well and don't really follow it that closely. Uh, so back, so the model portfolios, that was the question Andre Tate was asking. Please explain setting up the model portfolios. So if you join 420 Investor, it's gonna be in a lot more detail. Uh, but, uh, you know, the first model portfolio I started, which was at the request of my subscribers back in late 2013 is flying high, uh, flying high, uh, is up like, I don't know, 13 X, 14. No, no, it's more than that. It's like 15 X since then. And it, it's, a, it's more of a trading model portfolio. I take positions sizes or as much as 20%. It's a shorter term. It's not day trading, but, uh, every trade in there is, is, put it in with the same uh, principles of, I identify situations where I think the price could go up by more than four times than I think it could go down. That obviously doesn't work out all the time. Sometimes it goes up more, but usually it doesn't go up that much. And sometimes it goes down more than I think, just to be really clear about that. But that's the, the principle. The other two model portfolios are a little bit different from one another, but they're both longer term focus. I don't bet on market direction. They've both just totally outperformed the overall market. I'm a little disappointed. They're both down a lot less than the market this year. But last year when the market was down, they were both up. So uh, in the, there, there's a bunch of rules. I'm not going to name them all right now. It's not really worth it, but it's all very clearly explained. So you can find the best model portfolio for yourself. Uh, with that said, like I, like I said, I'm, I encourage independent thinking. I don't like herds. And uh, so they're just model portfolios. Uh, next question, thoughts on CB Sciences. Again, hemp is a mess. That company is one that I think is really cheap, but they're swimming upstream right now. Very, very tough 
uh, I do have uh, a position, full disclosure, that's small in uh, my longer term focus model portfolios, or I'd say medium size. Next question, uh, opinion on LHS as a company. So uh, Liberty uh, is a, 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 not a multi-state operator, it's a single state operator. And Liberty is, uh, I think has done a great job of uh, secu uh, securing its future by selling off some assets. Uh, they've built up their Florida operations. So uh, I had a huge position in Liberty a couple months ago. Uh, right now I have no position at this very second. Uh, in my model portfolios. And by the way, I never have stock trades in my own account. That's just a conflict of interest that uh, isn't right for me to have. I know a lot of people don't like that, but just want to get that out there if anybody has questions about it. I've never invested in a cannabis company. But uh, I had a big position in Liberty near the lows. And the reason was it seemed too cheap, number one. And number two, there are a whole bunch of good multi-state operators that are private and their pathway to going public has become a little bit more challenged. And I think Liberty as a merger partner could be excellent, but uh, I ended up selling out on the way up as it rallied. I didn't hit the exact high, but I got close to it. The subscription must be paid all at once. Yes. So what I learned, I used to have a monthly subscription and people would come in when times were good and they would just check out. And I have an analyst that I pay and I can't tell my analysts, I don't need you this month, sorry. So it's really worked out well for everybody. A more, you know, fewer subscribers probably because a lot of people don't want to commit for a year. You can commit for a year, but you have 30 days to cancel as a reminder. But uh, uh, it's really worked out well for me and for our community to have annual subscriptions. It, it, it's, you know, investors are their worst enemies. Uh, I could go on, I could do a whole webinar on that topic alone. And what ends up happening is this is a volatile market. Uh, let's say somebody joined in July. It looked like the market was about to, to, you know, was bottoming. And then, you know, they join for a few months. They leave in September. Well, you know, uh, in October or November, December, the market might have gone up a lot. And that monthly person is just gone. They're not only are they mad at me because they lost money, but they're maybe missing out on long-term opportunity because they're, the time was bad. So in a year, I think people can get a nice sense of what the service is all about. Uh, the future of Aurora. Well, look, Aurora has some capital uh, constraints right now. Uh, they uh, are losing a lot of money as well. So I, th I think the future of Aurora is going to be one where they have to make some tough decisions about fixing their balance sheet. They've already started to do that. And they're going to have to prioritize how they want to spend because they, they don't necessarily have uh, the capital right now. Like I said earlier, all these large LPs, and we're talking about Canopy and Aurora, Tilray, Kronos, and uh, th th those four in particular are all talking about, these are the four largest ones, they're all talking up hemp in the U.S. And to me, uh, this is not necessarily going to work out very well. Uh, and, and I would say... Uh, that's something that Aurora has to kind of figure out. <coughs> uh, the next one is, is MPX International a good international play? I'm, I'm not going to answer that one. I really don't. I think that company is very uh, immature. By the way, uh, I disclose on New Canvas Ventures, all of our clients, MPX International is a client, uh, just FYI. And I disclose that regularly at Fortune Investor, just so everybody's clear. Just because I have a client at New Canvas Ventures, an advertising client, doesn't mean I like their stock. Uh, uh, so I'm not saying I don't like MPX International. I just don't have an opinion. Uh, it's it's a very new play. Uh, what are my thoughts on Tilt and Greenland? So look, if you want my thoughts, join. I'm not going to sit here and answer these detailed questions. I will tell you, neither of those are on my focus list. Tilt is a client of New Canvas Ventures, uh, and uh, I'll leave it at that. What do I believe will be the most important catalyst to change sentiment for U.S. cannabis stocks in 2020? So I didn't really mention it, but I think the most important catalyst is going to be when people start to see better profitability in massive revenue numbers. And that's where we're headed. I already showed you that chart from before where we had three companies that are doing more than a quarter of a billion annualized uh, in the third quarter. And those numbers are going to be pushing 500 million or more next year. And I think that's going to attract some people. Uh, and I think one of the challenges right now has been the, some of the operating losses. And uh, I think those are going to get better. 
discuss the segments in the cannabis industry. I, I would just refer you back to what I showed you earlier. There's a slide in here. You can watch the replay. Uh, I break the cannabis industry really into international versus domestic. And then within that, I look at direct cannabis operators, which would include state regulated or FDA path. Or I guess you could put CBD companies in there too. So those three segments. And then there's ancillary and there's a slide that breaks it all down. Uh, Next question, and thanks for all these questions. Uh, are there any numbers where individual brands seem to be taking a lead with consumers? No, not really. How do we judge a company's stable of brand, social media numbers, or innovation and delivery method? I, I, I think that's a great question, and it's very difficult at this point. That information's really not there so much. A lot of people pay attention to the POS data out of uh, 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 BDS analytics and headset, and, and, and that's really the best uh, way to do it. Uh, so, you know, fair question. I don't have a great answer. I, I don't invest based on light bulb count. That is for sure. Uh, all right. Next question. What's my opinion on sundial? Again, I'm not going to answer that one. I don't cover that one very closely and I'm not really here to just tell you what I think about every stock. Uh, will tan cannabis tech blows us solve the problem of driving testing? I really don't like that concept at all. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, you know, THC is not like alcohol, and uh, the amount of THC in one person would be devastating. It would have them on the floor rolling around wanting to die, and th that same amount in another person, it wouldn't even impact them. So a, a, a device isn't really going to get to impairment, unfortunately. Discuss share dollar cost averaging. So dollar cost averaging is a term you can Google. I'm not going to have anything of value to add to that. Uh, when will... Uh, when will public MSOs start trading on the OTC? They are trading on the OTC right now. They tend to be listed in the, uh, on, the, on the Canadian Securities Exchange, um, but uh, you know, they also trade on the OTC. So the better question would have been, when will they trade on the NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange? And the answer there is, don't hold your breath. All right, what are, what are the two ETFs that I like? Okay, I didn't say I like them. I said that there's two of them that, that are, are large, and that's uh, Horizons, HMMJ in Canada, and then MJ on the New York Stock Exchange ARCA. Uh, next, why are companies moving away from international financial reporting standards to US GAAP? The answer is the number of investors that are in the US compared to Canada. Uh, and that's what's dictating that. It's not like they want to do it necessarily, although I bet they don't mind. With the hemp mess, do I, what, uh, with, a hemp, with hemp a mess, do you use medical companies, GW Pharma? Okay, I'm not really understanding that question. So there's a really mistaken, concept out there that what's bad for hemp from industrial uh, CBD from industrial hemp is good for GW Pharma. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's just a really dumb, dumb approach. It's, and I see people write about and talk about it. It's, it's not the same thing. GW Pharma sells a narrowly approved drug that's reimbursed by the FDA that has clinical, I mean, by the insurance companies that has FDA clinical trials behind it. But nobody's buying that for the same reasons they're buying uh, CBD from industrial hemp. So uh, next question. Uh, uh, who is the leader in cannabis use testing in the public market? Nobody. Uh, next, what's happening at Origin House? They're about to merge with Cresco. Uh, their stock uh, for every share of Origin House, uh, assuming that the, the vote goes through at the end of the month, which I would say is a 98% chance, then each of those shares in January will be converted to 0 0.7031 shares of Cresco Labs. <clears throat> Next, many companies uh, are already generating revenues, but big losses, and smart investors will look to profitability. How far are we to see profit? So some companies are profitable. And I think, you know, uh, the uses of cash are into uh, supporting operations, uh, obviously, uh, and then also into building out. And I think when you're looking at these companies, you, you have to have a good handle for where's the cash going. So there are some companies like Aurora and Canopy that have just math. You can go back to that slide uh, when we, uh, if, if you watch the replay or just go to newcanvasventures.com and, and click on uh, revenue ranking up at the top. And you'll see some companies have massive losses, Medmen and those two Canadians that you said, and some companies are profitable. And I think a lot of companies are really close. And I think that's going to be a big, uh, eye-opener this year when you see some of these companies uh, flip to profitability. How much has shorting contributed to the 2019 downturn? That, that's a hard one for me to answer. I mean, yeah, there's shorts out there. I don't have, I like to answer questions with data. I don't have any data for that. 
the future of CGC with investments, Constellation Main CGC. Again, I'm not going to really get into the details of what I think about companies on this one. Will MedMen show some improvement? Again, same answer on that one. How can an inexperienced investor benefit from joining 420? So first of all, whether you join or not, I, I've produced a, uh, a, uh, a series of, I think, 10 videos. My, my, my son is in his early 20s. I just shared it with him because he's interested in investing. So you don't even have to be in, interested in cannabis investing. I, I did these a few years ago because I was inundated with inexperienced investors joining. Uh, you know, they liked the promise of cannabis, but they didn't know anything about investing. So I felt it was my responsibility to help educate them. And so if you join 420 Investor, I'm a pretty good teacher in general, and you can always ask questions and you'll learn, and you can listen to my 10 videos a week and you'll pick up on things. And if things don't make sense, you can ask. You can also benefit because we have some dedicated forums that are targeting inexperienced investors and some of our more experienced members uh, uh, have taken it upon themselves to help out on the education and answer questions as well. Of course, you know, this is, this is user information. It's not coming from me. So I always say, you know, caveat on that, that this is not officially official. And I don't review all those answers just FYI, but we do have a nice community as well. So a couple different ways to benefit. Uh, the main one of which would be, I, I really try to help inexperienced investors. If I were to buy a US MSO, which one is your pick? Hey, really easy. First of all, I never give one pick. That is dumb. One pick, stupid. Second of all, if you join, you'll get the answer very quickly. And uh, I'll leave it at that. What's going on with Hemp Inc? This is a scam company that I've been following for many years. I've written about it publicly. You are wasting your time even typing that question. Forget about that one. My quick overview on IIPR. So I'm not going to tell you what I think about the stock, but I will say this is a very important company. Uh, it's a cannabis REIT. And I mentioned earlier, there's a capital crunch right now. And IIPR uh, has uh, been funding the cannabis industry through sale leasebacks. It's very important. So I, it is on my focus list. I watch it closely. Uh, happy to weigh in further with you if you join. Uh, the screen isn't changing. It's just showing the offer because that's what's up there. What would you like it to do? I can roll it back again. So it is, uh, I, I had this uh, for you know a couple of reasons today. Uh, first of all, it's been very rare that I've had a, a special offer two years since we've discounted. But I think uh, I wanted to do this right now because I think it's actually a good time to be uh, stepping into the market. I am not one of these people that promises get rich quick or anything like that. As a matter of fact, you will probably lose money. You'll get frustrated. It's not easy. I will tell you that. My goal is to help everybody navigate it uh, to, to the best possible and learn along the way. Uh, it's, it's a very immature market. It's very volatile. Uh, startup companies in and of themselves are, have inherent risks. So not easy, but we've We've seen the market transition, as I mentioned earlier, from being a wild west to something that's a lot more real. And as a CFA, I was very careful about how I presented uh, this to, uh, to, to the public. And uh, I, I spoke at the CFA Society. They'd asked me for years to come talk in Houston to the local society about investing in cannabis. And I said, no, no, no. And I finally said yes. Uh, uh, a little less than three years ago, April of 17, when I felt like we had hit an uh, inflection point where the industry had become real and it was worth talking about. And so, uh, uh, you know, since then, we've seen CNBC start up their coverage. We've seen a lot of the media. Uh, there's been a, a rapid uh, development of not such great ones, but a lot of ETFs and funds out there. It's, it's definitely become real. So I... I would encourage everybody that wants to benefit from somebody who's been following the space for uh, literally six years and three months, or six years and, sorry, six years and 10 months, uh, to uh, consider joining. As I mentioned, uh, uh, you'll save 30% today only. Uh, you'll lock in uh, what I think is a, a very low price and for the value that's delivered. And you can cancel in the first 30 days if if you don't think that it is what you uh, wanted. And uh, all I can say is there will be 10 steps forward and eight steps back and uh, you'll really enjoy uh, uh, having somebody at your side to help you. Uh, so 
just a few more questions and then we're gonna call it a wrap. Uh, just these three questions that I have right now, so, so don't ask any other questions, please. Uh, why does Europe seem to be a bust? And you know, that's a good question. Uh, I, I was really excited about Germany uh, because Germany uh, had has a program that's covered by insurance with distribution in uh, stores, but it's been very slow to roll out uh, for whatever reason. So it just hasn't been a, a huge catalyst. And uh, I wouldn't call it a bust. It's just like everything, uh, everything in the cannabis space, uh, slow to meet expectations. The next question is about Green Star Biosciences, and I'm not going to comment on that. It's not one I would ever even pay attention to. I'll, I'll leave that comment with you. And then what CBD beverage company is talking with LaCroix distribution? I, I'm not sure. I would look in the forum to try to answer that question. But again, I'm not here to answer very specific questions about stocks. I was really trying to explain my outlook for the year ahead and uh, some of the risks and opportunities that I see. So again, uh, we're going to conclude now. I appreciate everybody taking time out of their busy day. And uh, I also appreciate your interest in the cannabis sector. Uh, if you want to join 420 Investor with a 30-day cancellation, it's 420. Uh, Ha ha ha, but $420, 30% off the normal price that's been in place for the last two years. Uh, and you need to do that today if you want to take advantage of that. And then I would also remind everybody, uh, we're giving away a lot of stuff for free at uh, New Cannabis Ventures, all sorts of resources to help you stay on top of the uh, on top of the market. So, you know, if you don't, if joining uh, 420 Investors is not for you, I, I hope that you will follow along at New Canvas Ventures, we have a great free weekly newsletter that goes out. And, uh, you know, I think our coverage uh, is, is really respected universally by operators uh, and investors in the space. So uh, it's a great place for information. Uh, you'll get it first at 420 Investor, of course. So uh, with that said, I'm going to stop it here. And uh, again, thank you, everybody, for attending today. Uh, and hope to see you on the other side. Take care. Okay, let's get started. Uh, I'm assuming that the folks in Michigan are recording this, but I'm not sure. <clears throat> so.